when I was in the CIA in the 1960s, we were involved in the overthrow of various civilian governments and the installation of military dictatorships. There had been a very interesting and progressive political development in Guatemala from 1948 with the overthrow of a military dictatorship and the uh, installation of democratic governments for the first time ever in Guatemalan history. They carried out uh, literacy campaigns and they tried to install an agrarian reform program that affected the lands of the United Fruit Company based in Boston. It happened that the law firm of the United, United Fruit Company in Boston, it included as partners John Foster Dulles, who was then the Secretary of State, and his brother Alan Dulles, who was then the director of the CIA. Together, on behalf of United Fruit, they convinced Eisenhower to overthrow the progressive government in Guatemala, which they did, in, that is, the CIA did, in 1954. From the very beginning, President Truman determined that the CIA would be involved also in the interference in the internal political affairs of other countries. This has been uh, undertaken by the United States and many countries around the world. Irregular and guerrilla warfare also has that purpose. And it was seen very clearly, for example, in Nicaragua in the 1980s, that the amount of suffering and damage that the CIA created and supported Contras had caused throughout the countryside in Nicaragua that eventually in the 1990 elections, Nicaraguans voted for relief and voted in the uh, traditional political forces that had existed uh, since before the Sandinista movement had taken over. That has not happened in Cuba. No nos engañemos creyendo que en lo adelante todo será fácil. Quizás en lo adelante todo sea más difícil. For the entire period after the beginning of the revolutionary process then, 1959. Cuba has been the victim of a, an undeclared war which has taken many different forms. There has been terrorism in large amounts. There has been uh, paramilitary raids. There have been attacks from the sea. There has been sabotage campaigns. You can ask the question, why would the United States do this? Why wouldn't they just let leave Cuba alone to develop its own political form and its own society? Why have to meddle in this country's affairs and try to destroy this revolutionary process through 10 presidencies at least in the United States? To understand this, I think briefly you have to go back to uh, the period of the independence movements in Latin America. One should recall that uh, the, Latin, the Latin American revolutionary movements for their independence from Spain occurred during the period roughly from 1810 to 1820. By the 1820s, all of Latin America, save Cuba and Puerto Rico, plus the British and the French and the Dutch colonies, uh, had obtained their independence. <laughs> The United States at that time was opposed to the independence of Cuba because they were afraid that Cuba would become another black republic, as Haiti had done at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, during the 1840s, uh, 50s, and 60s, when the abolitionist movement in the United States had taken hold, uh, there was, of course, conflict over whether Cuba, if it came into the republic, should be a slave state or a non-slave state. And one can say that every president since Jefferson, all through the 19th century, tried to take control of Cuba in one way or another. But the United States, when I was writing my first book, I uh, concluded in the book that the CIA is nothing more than, nothing less than the secret political police of international foreign policy, that is the foreign policy of the United States.
and it means the formation of death squads. Uh, it means the disappearances of people by the tens of thousands during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And it has a very special, determined, that is a particular task. And that task is what I was doing during those 12 years I was in the CIA. Obsession with Cuba as a strategic island I'm on the soft underbelly of the United States at their entrance to the Gulf and the entrance to the Caribbean meant that Cuba was essential for U.S. national security. And this has been the doctrine all through these years. This all ended in January of 1959 when the United States uh, backed Batista military government was overthrown. One has to remember that this Batista government from 1952 until the end of 1958 was one of the nastiest of the nasty dictatorships throughout Latin America that the United States has supported. The United States believed and still believes that it has a role to play here, that Cuba should be under the control of the United States for U.S. national security purposes. But it's also because of the continuing manifest destiny that comes out in U.S. foreign policy year after year. It comes out with the missionary nature, the evangelical nature of the U.S. political system, with the belief that we are the essence of good and that we have to spread this good to other peoples. All of these programs in the early 1960s and extending through the 1960s were in one form or another a policy of state-sponsored terrorism against Cuba. When I was in the CIA's uh, operations training program before I went first to South America uh, in 1960, I was at a secret CIA training base called Camp Perry which is just outside Williamsburg, Virginia. And at this training base, uh, we were taught to, to run and develop secret operations and all the ways to keep them secret, what is known in the business as tradecraft. Among the uh, subject matter were explosions, that is, the use of explosions, of incendiary devices, um, of weapons, and so forth. And I remember in um, March of 1960, our instructors in sabotage could not conceal their happiness, their glee, when the news got back from Havana of the destruction of the French cargo vessel, Le Coubre, in Havana Harbor. It was unloading a shipment of arms from Belgium when, uh, when there was a huge explosion which killed the crew and the, uh, and the, uh, the stevedores doing the unloading. Uh, the fire brigade came along with militia to try to put out this enormous blaze, which was occurring at a wharf right next to the main uh, Havana railway station. And um, about an hour after the first explosion, another and even larger explosion occurred, which killed the fire brigade people and the militia that were assisting in putting out the fire. Altogether, more than 100 people were killed in that blast, and hundreds were injured. If you drive down along the uh, Port Avenue right now to the main railway station, on the left, right where that ship was docked, there is a sculpture made of scrap steel, which was taken from the ship, and it includes the rudder. It is a memorial now, and since then, to all those people who died in that CIA sabotage operation. I went down to Ecuador uh, toward the end of 1960, and I was there working as an operations officer based in the United States Embassy, undercover as a political officer and um, assistant attache. And I remember very well that a week or so before the Bay of Pigs invasion, the news came out from Havana that the most important, the largest 
and uh, recognized as the best department store in this city was burned down. It was called El Encanto. And I had shopped there on my first trip to Havana in um, early 1957. That, too, was a CIA sabotage operation. And it was carried out through the confection of dolls made of an incendiary powder, made to look exactly like dolls that the, the, the department store sold. And at the given time, these dolls exploded. I worked with this incendiary uh, material. It, it was like a powder. But when you set it off, it, it was a huge explosion, like a bomb, practically. Well, one woman was killed in that, uh, that, in that sabotage operation, was killed in the blaze, and her name was Faye del Valle. Now, every time I drive up Galeano on my way to Chinatown for lunch, for example, I pass Faye del Valle Park, which is where El Encanto once stood and where it stood when I shot there in 1957. Altogether, during this 45-year war against Cuba, undeclared war against Cuba. Nearly 3,500 Cubans have been killed. More than 2,000 Cubans have been disabled for life. Me la arrebató Fidel Castro y con la complicidad de la Unión Soviética y de una prensa adulatoria que a nivel from the 1980s until the well into the uh, 21st century, Cuban-American extremists of the first generation of immigrants has been controlling United States policy toward Cuba. And this policy is of the most extremist and uncompromising uncom type. They are insistent that Americans not be allowed to travel to Cuba. They are insistent that every measure be taken to, to undermine and to squeeze and to destroy the Cuban economy. Economic warfare is another example of how this undeclared war against Cuba has been carried out. And the purpose of this economic warfare, which has never really ended, is to squeeze the people. That is, to turn them against the revolution, to make them suffer to the point where they will tire of it and they will turn against the revolution. That's the point of economic warfare because it is meant to affect the whole population and not just, let's say, the government or the revolutionary leadership or the revolutionary party, for example. But where Cuba is concerned, these uh, operations to develop a political opposition received major emphasis from the 1990s on into the uh, into the, the 21st century. And AID in recent years, this is let's say from 1998 on, has spent uh, nearly $30 million in, on Cuban programs. And most of this money is paid to support what has become a cottage industry of NGOs, most of them based in Miami. All of these things have been carried out against Cuba through the years. And until the United States determines that Cuba should have a right to make its own decisions on the type of political and social system that it wants, these things are going to continue. By the time the Batista dictatorship was overthrown, the Cubans knew what to expect from the United States. They knew the United States would try to repeat here in Cuba what they had successfully carried out in Guatemala five years earlier. Che, of course, was part of the revolution here, and he knew what had happened in Guatemala, so did the rest of the leadership, and so they knew they had to be prepared for aggression from the United States. As recent as April 2003, the uh, South Florida Sun Sentinel, based in Fort Lauderdale, carried a, uh, a large uh, reporting section 
on the training outside Miami in the Everglades of a group called the F-4 Commandos. And there are photographs in this reportage that show these people, Cuban exiles, in combat gear, combat uniforms, carrying assault weapons, and training for, uh, for commando raids against Cuba. This is the situation that Cuba is faced with in Miami. So naturally, if they send their own people to Miami to report back here as early as possible on the planning of terrorist activities, such as the bombing of tourist hotels here, um, a whole campaign was carried out in the late 1990s uh, against hotels in, tried to, in, in order to try to scare tourists away from Cuba. The Cubans eventually caught these people and they were Central American mercenaries hired by one of the notor most notorious of the Cuban terrorists, a man trained by the CIA, a man who worked for years for the CIA, and who continued through the years to carry out terrorist attacks against Cuban targets. This man's name is Luis Posada Carriles. One of the most notorious uh, terrorist acts of this man, Luis Posada Carriles, was his help in the planning of the bombing of a Cuban commercial airliner in early October 1976, in which all 70 feet, 73 people on board were killed. He has a litany that stretches through the years. He was eventually arrested by Venezuelan authorities and charged with that crime. I the drug. Este fue el que las pensó, el que las organizó y el que mandó a la gente para que las pusieran. Yo de cualquier hecho dentro del territorio cubano, en contra del régimen de la Habana, me responsabilizo totalmente. But he escaped from prison and in the early 1980s he showed up in El Salvador where he began work at the Ilopongo Air Base outside San Salvador in the, re in the CIA's resupply operations to the Contras operating in Nicaragua. Another of the most famous of the uh, CIA trained Cuban terrorists is a pediatrician named uh, Orlando Bosch. Orlando Bosch has a record going back to the 1960s of dozens of terrorist activities. He too was working with Posada Cariles in the bombing of the Cuban airliner in 1976. He was arrested by the Venezuelans. He was tried three times and three times on technicalities he was acquitted. Of course all the money for the support for Bosch and for the uh, let's say the springing from prison of Posada Cariles came from these uh, extremist Cuban Americans in Miami around the Cuban American National Foundation. In 1987, the Venezuelans released Bosch and he left the country. He turns up in the United States, I believe it's in February of 1988. He's immediately arrested on charges stemming from a parole violation of a conviction or on a conviction from a previous terrorist act in the United States. The next year, 1989, or uh, from that time on, the Department of Justice creates a report showing that he is a known terrorist. They, they, they list these terrorist acts. In this document, there were 30 terrorist acts, and it was the justification for his expulsion from the United States as an undesirable. He was on the verge of being expelled from the United States in early 1990, when another of the Cuban extremists in Miami, this time it's the Congresswoman, Ileana Ros Latinin, begins to lobby on his behalf, that is on Bush's behalf, with then President Bush, the father, to quash the deportation order. The main support that she has is from her campaign manager, the man responsible for her election in, to the Congress in Washington, who is none other than Jeb Bush, the son of the then president and future governor of Florida.
So between the two of them, they prevail, prevail on the father, George Bush, senior, to uh, quash the deportation order in 1990 uh, against Orlando Bosch. He is set free, and he's been walking the streets of Miami ever since, a free man. But he has never renounced terrorism. Hay derecho a, a derribar aviones, a hundir barcos, a hundir submarinos, a hacer cualquier cosa. Posada Cariles was arrested in uh, Panama in the year 2000, along with three other very well-known CIA-trained terrorists, sabotage experts. They were um, captured or they were arrested with a large amount of, I believe it was C4 explosive, enough to have killed hundreds, if not more than a thousand people. Their plan was to uh, explode a bomb at the uh, auditorium where Fidel Castro was to be speaking at the University of Panama during the uh, Ibero-American summit. In fact, he was arrested just at the time the conference was beginning. One of the most Im interesting aspects of the arrest of Posada Cariles and the other three in Panama in, uh, in 2000 was the, the, the role that the Cuban Intelligence Service played in these arrests. Uh, it happens that they were on the trail of these guys from somewhere in Central America. It's never been revealed. But all through their stay in Panama, they knew the remote farm where these guys were holed up with their explosives. And they knew the hotels where they were staying. So that when Fidel Castro went to this summit meeting, uh, where the King of Spain was uh, present, when the uh, president of the Spanish government was there, and the chiefs of state of all of the Latin American countries, or the Spanish-speaking countries, were also present. When, he, when Fidel arrived for this uh, conference, uh, he immediately gave a press conference. And in this con press conference, he gave out all this information about these terrorists. Posada Carriles arrivó a Panamá el 5 de noviembre con documentación falsa y sin ningún disfraz. Tiene en Panamá cómplices de su entera confianza en los cuales se apoya. Una copia del caballero. Estamos pidiendo la cooperación del pueblo. They were then immediately arrested by the Panamanian police. And they were then held under arrest for years until they were finally brought to trial. But it was a tremendous coup for the Cuban intelligence service and uh, simply reminded me of when I was in the CIA. The Cuban intelligence service was a, a, a very important target for us to penetrate. As far as I know, the Cuban uh, service was never penetrated by an agent of the CIA who was on the inside of that service. And they have tried, I tried myself, in many different ways to penetrate this service by recruiting their people, by trying to break their codes, to get their code pads from embassies and so forth. And I have no doubt at all that in the uh, 21st century, they continue to be very high on the list of priorities for penetration by the CIA. I went into the CIA with tremendous enthusiasm. I was 22 years old, and I went through three years of training. Then some time working in the Western Hemisphere or the Latin American Division of the CIA Operations Directorate in Washington before going down toward the end of 1960 to work out of the United States Embassy in Quito as an assistant political attaché. It was nothing unusual for a young man like me, patriotic, conformist, coming from a comfortable family to go into government service. And so I went into the CIA for adventure. I was only 22 and I had romantic views toward things. And um, it wasn't until I got down to Ecuador and uh, had been working there for a year or two that I began to get a political education. You can't deny what you see as you drive your car down the street or out in the countryside. I traveled a lot around the countryside of Ecuador in a Land Rover. I saw the, the injustices all around me in terms of the social system, the political system, the economic system, 
and this affected me. When I got to uh, Mexico in the middle of 1967, a year and a half before the Olympic Games, they have assigned this woman as the representative of the organizing committee of the Olympic Games to work with the United States Embassy on the cultural program. And in the fall of 1967, and um, about a week into October, um, we were having dinner, and suddenly she explodes. She starts to scream using the most um, unrepeatable language about this CIA that had uh, murdered Che Guevara in Bolivia. It had just been announced that day. So I'm sitting at the table. She doesn't know I'm a CIA officer. I knew what had happened, and I knew that the CIA had a man there at the moment of Che's assassination. That's Felix Rodriguez, a Cuban who worked for the CIA. So I knew all this. I'm sitting there at the table thinking to myself, uh, Man, you got to decide. You can't do both. You got to choose. I left the CIA with the idea of forgetting it all and starting a new life. But you don't forget these things. And so from my resignation on, I remembered all of the way the CIA operates, the things that I did. And I'm not the only person who has written on his career. I started it all. But there have been dozens of others who have followed. And I've read their books, and nothing changes through the years. It all continues more or less the same. Well, we all know, don't we, the reasons why the United States intervened in the Gulf the way they, we did. Uh, in the end, killing between 100,000 and 200,000 Iraqis, uh, as opposed to 303, I think, Americans killed either in combat or in combat-related accidents. And we certainly have uh, restored to power the legitimate uh, authority in Kuwait. In fact, we've done it applying that age-old, all-American political principle of one man, one vote. In this case, one man, the emir, one vote, his. <laughs> we heard Bush back in August, didn't we, uh, at the very beginning say that, saying that our way of life 
was at stake. And we had to do something about that invasion of Kuwait. We also heard, didn't we, besides the way of life was at stake, we had to per intervene to protect the access to the energy resources of the Persian Gulf. Another one was that we had to stop naked aggression. What we did not get are alternative interpretations of the events that occurred. And that's what I want to speak about here tonight. It's my opinion that the United States needed an international crisis, an international threat, to re replace the crisis in Europe that largely disappeared with the collapse of communism and the chaos in the Soviet Union. Why? In order to keep the permanent war economy going, to justify continuing the situation wherein more than, well more than 50% of the federal budget goes to military purposes. Well, this means that the military expenditures in the United States are the motor of the U.S. economy, and they have been that ever since about 1950. It's worth reviewing the history because that's where this uh, crisis, I think, comes from, this sought-for, needed crisis. In early 1950, there was extreme worry at the highest levels of the Truman administration that the United States was likely to return to the conditions of the Great Depression of the 1930s. And so early in 1950, the decision was taken that this domestic economic problem was going to be solved through militarism. That is, through rearmament in the United States and through U.S. financing of the rearmament of Western Europe, particularly Western Germany. The document which provides the analysis of the world at that time and the U.S. place in the world and the internal situation in the United States uh, was top secret for 25 years. In 1975, it was accidentally or through error uh, released and published. It is known as NSC 68. It was written by NSC standing for National Security Council. It was written by Paul Nitze and it is a very detailed document. The main <clears throat> operative uh, conclusion, though, was this. This is a quote from the document. The United States and other free nations will, within a period of a few years at most, experience a decline in economic activity of serious proportions unless more positive governmental programs are developed. Well, the solution adopted those more positive governmental programs was expansion of the military. But Truman could not get this program through Congress at first. There was opposition there and public opposition to the enormous new taxes that this program would require. He went on national radio, declared a state of national emergency, and said what Bush's remarks about our way of life being at stake reminded me of. He mustered all the height and emotion he could and Truman said, among other things, he said, our homes, our nation, all the things that we believe in are in great danger. This danger has been created by the rulers of the Soviet Union. In his speech, he also called for massive increases in military spending for U.S. and European forces, quite apart from the needs in Korea. Well, there was no threat from the Soviet Union. They were still rebuilding from the rubble of World War II in which they had lost 20 million people. They were no threat, but they were manufactured from 1950 on, from the time of Korea on, as a grave threat to the United States. And that became the justification for this program, which Truman, through manipulation of the Korean War, had been able finally to get through Congress. The result was that in the first two years, that is the two years between 1950 and 1952, the U.S. military budget more than tripled from $13 billion in 1950 to $44 billion in 1952. And during the same two-year period, U.S. military forces doubled to 3.6 million people under arms. This was the beginning of the permanent war economy in the United States. The Korean War, by the way, went on for three more years after it could have ended. In the end, 34,000 U.S. were dead, more or less, more than 100,000 wounded, and the total casualty count was in the millions. It is worth recalling that because from 1950 on, the Soviet threat was the justification, the justification for the permanent war economy and the justification for these enormous military expenditures. 
expenditures. What does that mean as far as the United States is concerned? Well, it means that we have not addressed or begun to solve the many domestic crises that we all know exist. There's no need really to go through this litany of the worst educational system in the developed world. One in three in this country illiterate, either totally or to the degree that they cannot function in a society based on the written word. Healthcare, not just the cost, but the fact that 40 million people in this country have no health insurance. The only developed country in the world with no national health plan. And on and on. The fact that only about, what is it, 60%, uh, about two-thirds of the eligible voters register to vote. And of those who register, only about 80% actually vote, so only in the end, 50% of the eligible voters vote in national elections in this country. And that means that a president is elected with around 24, 25% of the uh, potential vote. The litany goes on, the environment, uh, the infrastructure, uh, finding a prevention and cure for AIDS, the violence we see everywhere and in every form in the United States. When you put all these things together, uh, I don't think anyone uh, would argue, add drugs, of course, anyone would argue that we have a domestic society in profound crisis. And the reason why, over all these years, these crises have not been solved is, in my opinion, because those who really control and rule the United States don't want them solved. Imagine what would happen if we had an informed electorate, if we didn't have the worst educational system, if we had uh, a negligible, perhaps, illiteracy rate here. There might be an informed electorate. We might be debating real substantive issues in the electoral process or in the political process in the United States. Uh, there might be a threat in this country of real democracy. If we solved the domestic crises in this country, people might clamor to participate if there was a real debate. There might be a threat of a third party, I mean a second party in the United States. Uh, <laughs> there are all kinds of threats to elitist control of the United States if we were to solve these domestic crises, in my opinion. And it is for this reason that we have always needed this foreign threat and this foreign crisis in order to justify putting the money into military expenditures instead of converting the economy once and for all to human purposes. During those 40 odd years of the Cold War, the CIA has been a very important factor or tool or instrument of the President of the United States in waging what is continuing today. This new world order of George Bush, or new international order, seems to me to be nothing more really than the institutionalization of the north-south dimension of the old Cold War. That is the war against the third world for control of their natural resources, their labor, and their markets. That is where the fighting really took place, as in Vietnam. This north-south dimension of the Cold War, the war against the Third World, continues today as we sit here with all its racist content. And we and our allies, that is the United States and its allies, are just as dependent, if not more, on the resources of these countries in the Third World as they ever were. And that dependency is not going to disappear. It's going to keep on growing through the years. So what I think Bush has in mind is uh, through this Persian Gulf crisis to send a message to any aspiring third world leader that third world radical nationalism will not be tolerated. It is a way in which, in fact, we are beginning to treat the third world or continuing to treat the third world like we treat third world people right here in the United States. They know their place, they have a role to perform, and they are expected to do it. If they don't, if they make trouble, they're going to be smashed. That is what happened, of course, with Iraq. I believe that Bush encouraged the Hussein administration and Saddam Hussein himself to believe that they could get away with taking over Kuwait with impunity. And there are many signs that point in this direction. Iraq never really formally recognized 
the independence of Kuwait. They have always claimed that Kuwait was part of the Iraq taken away by British imperialism, which is indeed the case. Last April, Se Assistant Secretary of State John Kelly testified, testified before Congress that the United States had no commitment to defend Kuwait. On July 25th, the U.S. Ambassador to, to Iraq, April Glaspie, meets with Hussein. Among other things, the U.S. Ambassador says to Hussein, Mr. President, I have a direct instruction from Secretary of State, State Baker to emphasize to you that the United States has, quote unquote, no opinion on your disputes with Kuwait, particularly your border disputes with Kuwait. She also said, I have an instruction from President Bush to seek better relations with Iraq. President Hussein, in response in several places, says that what Kuwait is doing through its overproduction is uh, uh, the equivalent to war against Iraq. They are destroying the Iraqi economy, he said, and we are going to take strong action. He as much as said that they were going to go to war. Well, in this meeting, with those 100,000 troops on the border, not one word from the U.S. ambassador of warning to Hussein not to invade. Well, put all those things together and you have to ask yourself the question, why did the Bush administration do nothing during that last week between the ambassador's meeting with Hussein and the invasion itself to prevent that invasion? They knew those 100,000 troops were there, but not one word from Glaspie to Hussein about it. My conclusion is that they wanted the invasion, that this was the site selected for the new international crisis that would justify continuation of the war economy in the United States. It was totally avoidable, uh, objectively speaking, but because of the tradition in the United States, uh, after all, we are a warrior culture, um, we do still live in the age of imperialism, and the demands of this system uh, require this crisis. Uh, I go back to the CIA for just a moment because it's worth recalling that the agency from the very beginning from the very beginning of the 1940s was used not only to collect intelligence from around the world, process it, and present it to policymakers like the president for their decisions or to help them in their decisions. Uh, obviously, that's what a, an intelligence service should do. But the CIA was used all through these years um, to subvert the democratic processes of other countries. Uh, at the very first meeting of the National Security Council, which was set up in the same law that established the CIA as the National Intelligence Service, this was October 1947, one month after Truman signed this bill into law, establishing the CIA and the National Security Council as the highest policy-making body in national security and foreign affairs. At their very first meeting in October 1947, the decision was taken to set aside $10 million for the CIA to intervene secretly in the Italian elections coming up about six months later. The CIA was not just used in these electoral operations. You know, the media operations were vast, and I'm sure they still are. Media operations basically means that the CIA pays a foreign journalist to publish the CIA's material as if it were the journalist's own. There were CIA interventions of all sorts, but one area I want to mention of special importance are what are known as liaison operations. Liaison operations are all those activities that the CIA undertakes with the intelligence and security services of other countries. And early on, the CIA began to set up security and intelligence services in other countries for purposes of internal security. One of the first places was Greece. There was a civil war, you know, in Greece in 1947 to 1949. The United States intervened on the, so on the side of the far right in Greece, and the U.S. side won. In the aftermath, the CIA set up a security service known as the KYP, or KEEP, KYP being the Greek initials for CIA. They gave it the same name. This security service was used to keep the far right in power in Greece for nearly 20 years. But when that power was threatened with upcoming elections in 1967, the CIA and this service, this uh, KYP, organized a military coup in Greece, which was successful leading to seven years of military dictatorship in Greece, of neo-fascist stripe. During that period, torture became an institution in Greece. Thousands of Greeks were forced into exile. Uh, I could uh, give you many, many examples of this. In Iran, for example, in 1954, the CIA, uh, 1953, the CIA uh, 
undermine the elected, democratically elected civilian government of the day of Mohammed Mossadegh, overthrew that government, installed the Shah as military dictator, and in the aftermath set up a service called the Sabak. This service over the 25 years of the Shah's regime became famous for its torture chambers and its assassinations of the Shah's political opponents. Uh, 1954, the US, the CIA, intervenes in Guatemala, undermines the civilian government, the government is overthrown, and from 1954 on, Guatemala has had one succession of military rulers after another, a military dictatorship. In the aftermath of this operation in 1954, the CIA set up an internal security service, and then others. But from these services set up and supported by the CIA all through the years came the death squads. In other words, the services established by the CIA then spawned these death squads in Guatemala. The very same thing in El Salvador. You can be as sure as you are of your own name that for the last 10 or 11 years, the CIA has been working in there day and night with those Salvadoran security services and military, collecting information, giving it to those services, which in turn are the same things as the death squads, information on activists in the human rights field, the student leadership, uh, trade unions, and so forth. <clears throat> and those have constituted the 75,000 or so people who have been murdered over 10 or 11 years in El Salvador. Disappeared, many of them, others tortured to death, their bodies thrown along the sides of the roads. Nobody knows how many have been killed in Guatemala by these military regimes, uh, which started with the CIA. Some say 100,000, some say 125,000, some say 150,000. Who knows? Nobody will ever really know the, um, the exact number who have been killed. But you multiply this around the world, uh, because I'm only mentioning a couple of examples uh, of these CIA operations. There have been now 44 years of this, and they have existed all around the world. And put those operations together with the overt military interventions and the enormous cost in human life of those, such as Grenada, Panama, uh, Iraq, Vietnam, for example, all of those, and you get, to, you get the picture of this expansionist, extremely aggressive U.S. foreign policy. Well, I don't think it's enough, really, to describe what the CIA does or uh, U.S. foreign policy in general. It's also necessary to ask a couple of questions. And going back to the Gulf for just a moment, consider this analysis of what really happened in the Gulf. You know that the United States has been exporting war material for for decades, beginning right around 1950 with the document I mentioned earlier. Tanks, guns of every sort, weapons, planes, ships, and military equipment of every sort. Well, with a national debt of three and a half trillion dollars in this country, 800 billion of it owned by foreigners, for handling of that debt, it seems that it was only a matter of time before the U.S. armed forces were sent abroad as one more export. Because what we did in the Persian Gulf crisis was to send abroad that enormous amount of military hardware, but this time we also exported the people to operate it. It was armed forces sent abroad to protect the resources and the uh, regimes, these family dictatorships of the sheikdoms of the Persian Gulf. What we did, in fact, was what we in the United States do the best. We made war, and we were financed in this exercise by the people who make things that people around the world want, cars, VCRs, and so forth, financed mainly by the Japanese and the Germans. And that puts the United States, as it's going to have a permanent presence in the Persian Gulf, in a very strong position vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese and the Germans who are not there militarily. And they are going to depend to a great degree for their energy resources, at least from that region, on U.S. policy. That is why they went along with the war. That is an interpretation of the Gulf crisis. And the other question that I wanted to raise is why we do these things as a country. Why we do these as a society, as a nation. Why do we do these grisly things abroad? I believe strongly that until we have fundamental change in the United States,
domestically, in the domestic system, until we have some kind of real democracy in this country, participatory democracy, where people have a say, and where we end the re-election of 95 to 97 percent of incumbents at every election, where there is a real political debate, until we change the domestic system, we're going to have elitist control of the United States, we're going to have these foreign adventures and the grisly things, as I mentioned, that the CIA does abroad. So the real problem is here at home in changing the domestic system, in bringing about a conversion of the economy to human purposes, solving the domestic crises, and getting the people out of office who are in there to back a continuation of the permanent war economy.